Great. Well, hello, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Catherine Stothart. I'm the Director of Events for the British Association of Psychological Type. This is a members-only webinar, which we've extended to members of the other APT, so it's great to see so many people here from USA, Canada, and also Australia. That's wonderful. Uh, this is the second in a series of webinars. David Hodgson uh, presented our first one back in September, and we've got a few more lined up. Um, Angelina, if you could flick to the next slide for me, I'll just show you the sort of events that we have coming up in the next couple of months leading up to our conference. So um, next month, we've got another webinar on how to use type ethically, being run by Jerry Gilpin and a couple of people from the back board. Then Richard Owen, as some of you will know, um, does some in conversations with experts in the type field. He'll be talking to James Johnston, who's the uh, author of the Gifts Compass, and with Richard Thompson, who's the Director of Global Research for the Myers-Briggs Company over the next couple of months. Then we have our online conference in April, followed by an in-person workshop on the 22nd of April in London. Um, we're doing this as an experiment to see what the appetite is for in-person workshops. So um, it'll be nice to see particularly the anyone who's able to come to that will be uh, very welcome. And we have our monthly type practitioner peer support groups as well that Sarah Perrett runs. If anyone works as a coach or is using type with individuals, it's a great opportunity for, do, for getting a bit of peer support. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so I think that's all I have to say. So the next most important thing I need to do really is introduce Angelina Bennett, who is um, well known to many of you. Um, you'll know that she's the former president of BAPT and speaker at many international conferences. She's a chartered occupational psychologist who's been using type for over 20 years and has got a particular interest in type development. Uh, she runs her own consultancy business and is co-director of Type Pro, which is a, a consultancy that qualifies people as type practitioners. So it's a real, real pleasure to introduce Angelina. Um, Angelina, at the moment, I can't see your slides. So, <laughs> so I'm just slightly worried. That <coughs> that's right. I, I've took them, taken them down. Ah, right. OK, that's fine. We'll check that they work. We could have a quick go. Yeah, no, that's fine. I know you were kindly showing my slides for me, so uh, that's brilliant. But I, I could actually see um, a person who I wasn't expecting to see on my other screen. So that gave me a bit of a shock. <laughs> right. So, Angelina, delighted to have you here. Over to you. Okay, so hello everybody. Thanks for thanks for joining the webinar. And there's a it's nice to see some familiar faces, and also nice to meet some people I haven't met before. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, ego development, which I've talked about for quite a few years now. Um, and um, much as I'd like to do a lot more work on it, it's a bit slow progress. So there's there's a few new things that come into it every now and again. Um, but some of you may be familiar with this with this already. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so the plan um, we've got we've got. Um, well, just under an hour and a half, and I'll leave some time at the end for Q&A. Um, and um, we're sort of playing it by ear timing wise, because um, I don't know how long things are going to actually take, but we'll see how we go. Um, but the plan is to introduce the idea of ego development theory um, to, to, to the group. And some of you may be familiar, as I said, but also to compare this with um, Jung's ideas about development and also Myers and Briggs's ideas about development um, to, to look at the parallels. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about, you know, wh why I combine it with type and how that how that can look um, and then go into some of the applications of that. So um, why is this important to thinking about how we work with type? how we coach people and how we how we de design those sort of development centers and bigger things. Um, and I'm gonna just touch on some of the empirical evidence that came from my doctorate that I did because um, this was part of my doctorate as well. So um, I actually have some hardcore stats on that, but I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that because it's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, but I talked about it um, at length ad nauseum at the symposium last year, which I believe is still a recording you can get your hands on even if you're not a member. So if, um, if that is of interest to anybody, there's a lot more detail in, in the symposium uh, presentation from last year. 
Okay, so before we go um, start, just so I can think about how I want to pitch this, um, I just want to launch a quick poll, so you'll have to do a quick click, um, about how familiar are you with ego development theory? So I shall launch that there. Hopefully you're seeing that. So you've got not at all, fairly familiar or very familiar. And I know Linda Behrens is on the call, so <laughs> I'm expecting at least one very familiar. <laughs> Okay, is that everybody? Okay, so we've got we've got some people who haven't come across this at all, some who are fairly familiar. So if you, um, can you see that? I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, so if you're fairly familiar, I'm hoping that um, there'll be some new things you pick up on, because if you're anything like me, you go to a presentation, you remember a few bits about it and you forget some other bits. So hopefully, even if you're familiar with it, you'll hear new things or other things will sink in or they'll be said in a different way. Or I often find with presentations as well, if they hit you at a different time, um, they mean something completely different. So they, they you know, you tune into different bits um, and the very familiar people feel free to to share your um, ideas and views and opinions as well. Um, so the ego development theory, um, it is um, for those of you who follow Linda Behrens, it's something that, that she uses as well. Um, but it, we, we have a slightly different take on it, but it's actually the same theory. I'm just trying to work out how to close this. There we go. So um, so some of you who, who've worked with Linda in the past as well might um, might be very familiar with this. Once I get going, um, you might say, oh, yes, I, th I think I'm familiar with this from Linda's work. OK, great. <clears throat> so are we moving? Yes, we're moving. Um, so let's um, think about the, the different ways we talk about type development. And I'll look at each one of these separately. So we have that whole nature versus nurture debates, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, how we develop over time. So how Myers and Briggs um, have described type development. And then the differentiation and individuation, which are Jung's words for how he described development. And then I'll move into the actual ego development theory. And I must, I must stress, this isn't my theory at all. It's from um, Jane Lovinger and then was further developed by um, Suzanne cook Um So I'm not taking credit for the theory, but um, I've, I've sort of had to do some tweaks to it to make it work with type. Um, but I think they, they, they all sort of hang together in my mind. So nature versus nurture anybody know who who has ever picked up a psychology book page one always says that people are made up of a combination of nature versus nurture genetics versus environment plus environment whatever you want to call it um and i think this is true too so um in terms of type, there is the idea that we're, we're inborn, we're hardwired, a lot of people say, to develop a certain type. Um, there's nothing we can do about it. And having, having had children, um, I could spot very, very, very early on, like as babies, in fact, one of them even before birth, um, which one was extroverted, which one was introverted. Um, and, you know, that those types do develop no matter sort of what environment you're in or um, how equally you're treated and things like that. So the idea here is to illustrate this. I think I hear extroverted such child at the door, actually. So um, um, apologies if he bursts in. Um, this is a sunflower seed. So the idea is, you know, a sunflower seed is always going to be a sunflower. It's never going to be an oak tree. It's never going to be a daffodil. It doesn't have a choice. It's going to be a sunflower. That's what's in there. Um, but the environment it's brought up with, if the if um, so, if you're a person of a certain type, pre predisposition. Um, or a sunflower seed if you're watered and nurtured and it's sunny and the soil is good and all that nice stuff you will grow up to be a great sunflower so in type terms if you have an environment and an upbringing and a family and surroundings that nurture your development and accept you and encourage you um, there's every chance you'll grow up to be um uh, you know a good example of your type you'll get to exercise your preferences you'll have a clear sense of your identity and what's more actually possibly picking up on molly's point in the introduction we were talking um you'll actually feel good about having that type there'll be nothing in your baggage that's made you feel that it's wrong to be the way you are so um yes now if you're brought up in the not so great environment so perhaps a place where um there's a strong 
family culture or characteristic of the parents that doesn't support your way of being, um, it might actually impair you slightly in, in how your type has developed. So to use myself as an example, which I'll do um, quite a lot during this because I know me, um, growing up as an introvert in a house full of um, extroverts, I was always had, had my nose in a book and um, people were constantly trying to sort of take my books away, tell me to stop being so, here we go, so um, antisocial and things like that. So, um, sorry, he's an, he's, he's an extroverted sensing type, I think. So what can we do? Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I, I was, my introversion was not appreciated and still isn't appreciated by the family at all. Um, and the whole, actually the whole thing of being an INTJ isn't particularly popular in my family. So, um, so yeah, so what happens though is um, even though it might be that there's a few INTJ sides that didn't flourish until um, I got my own space. Um, I actually have some very good extroversion skills because I've been made to do that. So um, there are some pros and cons actually with being in a, in a challenging environment. So that's basically the, the nature versus nurture idea with, with type. Okay. So then looking at development over time, how do we develop over time? So this is more of a um, the Myers and Briggs um, take on it. So um, Myers and Briggs, in their, in their theory, um, and anyone who's been through the sort of the standard training tend to, to take it this way. Um, the dominant function is the one that shows up earliest. And as I said, I think introversion, extroversion spotted at an early age. Um, but the dominant function tends to show up in terms of um, what we start to like doing, what our character is, what interests us, how we play with other children or not. Um, so again, to use myself as an example, there's me as a little INTJ, how cute. Um, and this is how my brain works. I'm either utterly obsessed with something or completely not interested in it. <laughs> um, so when I was young, anything that sort of fired my INTJ mind I think was just like you know catnip um, so I became obsessed with several little things in life and lo and behold I'm still I'm still on them now so um, the idea of ghosty spooky witchy things anyone who knows me knows that I'm I'm interested in all that sort of stuff still um, my house is full of people buy me witches I don't know why um, so my house is full of um hanging witches and things like that and I do have an annual witch party which you're all welcome to come to it's in October um I used to read books about mystery things you know um facts didn't interest me it's always mysteries ghosts spookies um Agatha Christie's murders whatever um tarot cards I dabbled in and I can see my friend Terry Connell in there who's a fellow INTJ tarot card enthusiast um so I still dabble in those a little bit, even though, of course, they don't tell you the future. And my, my first, one of my first school projects, <laughs> this is actually almost sad, was actually parapsychology and going to a Catholic school. Uh, that went down a storm, I'll tell you. Um, but they've just been like pervasive interests. And I actually did a parapsychology course just a couple of years ago. So these are all things that have really, I think, hook into the dominant function and, and pretty much stay there for your whole life. So if you haven't ever reflected on this for yourself before in your type, it's something quite interesting to do. What are you interested in? What are you interested in as a child? And what really stuck um, and never gone away? Okay, so um, as I said, the dominant function shows up in early childhood. And then um, according to the theory and also borne out by observation, um, the auxiliary function starts to emerge, sometimes in later childhood, sometimes it's even later than that, and it develops gradually over time. And um, sometimes this is where development pretty much stops. A lot of people um, don't develop their auxiliary function that, that well, um, and their dominant function is always running the show. Um, and anyone, anyone there who's familiar with... Um, the step three instrument that um, Isabel Myers was developing before she died and, and it got taken on by the others who, who finished it. Um, th there's a few bits in it, but the basic premise is about trying to get a good balance between your functions, but particularly that auxiliary and dominant working together. 
because then working together, you've got a balance between um, your perceiving and your judging. You've got a balance between your extroversion and your introversion. Um, so you've got it all going on. And there's a there's another aspect of a theory which I'm not sure exactly where it crops up, but I've heard it presented at conferences um, by people. And um, it's whether or not your auxiliary function is your servant or your helper. And a lot of us have it as our servant. So we make bad decisions because our dominant function, if your mind says, oh, I want to do this exciting, new and interesting thing that's never been done before. Um, and the auxiliary function says, yeah, yeah, that's a really good idea. Off you go. Um, whereas actually, if I was using my thinking function well, it should um, get a bit real, think about what the objectives are, critique me slightly, and I should be willing to accept that. Um, so a lot of us are in that position where it's our servant rather than our helper. Um, and then there's the whole life theory that um, as you go through midlife, um, the other functions will start to come into play a little bit more. And um, I sort of liken this to sort of having a volume control. So I see it that when you're when you're in your 20s or thereabouts or in earlier life, your preferences are sort of pretty much the volumes turned up on them. So, you know, it's like, yes, I am an INTJ. Um, and the other things are faded into the background. Whereas during midlife, um, if, if when it comes knocking, it's up to you whether or not you let it in. Um, it's like you turn the volume down a little bit on the, the preferences and up slightly on the non-preferences. So you're getting a little bit more of a balance. And um, it'll usually show up in terms of things that, that you either get interested in, but more so things that you're more accepting of and more open-minded to as well, that before you would have um, dismissed as like, you know, just not being of value or important. So that's, that's my take on it. And that, that's sort of the Myers and Briggs um, type development cycle. Okay. Um, and then looking at what Jung said, so Jung used the terms differentiation and individuation. Um, and the idea of differentiation is it's all about separating. So, so the idea is you, even though you're hardwired to develop a type, you will, um, when you're born, there's everything there in the, in the great melting pot. Hold on, will you go away? <laughs> So they're all in the melting pot there um, and some things will start to develop and some things won't. So the differentiation part is starting to get an identity of this is me and this is not me. This is what I like, this is what I don't like. So you're separating out those parts and differentiating what's you and what's not you. So there are three, um, this, this, this is like the, the real, in a nutshell version. There are three parts to Jung's type development. So there's the mental process differentiation. So it's knowing when you're judging or perceiving. And as I said, that's where the good balance comes in between um, being able to make a decision based on some good information or vice versa. So it's about using those well and not merging them together. Um, <clears throat> There's preference pair differentiation, um, which is where you're a bit clearer on, on what are you actually, what preference are you actually using? And um, when we're in our slightly undifferentiated stages, those, those things like, for example, sensing and intuition can be a bit merged or thinking and feeling can be a bit merged. So to give an example, if somebody has a thinking preference, but it's undifferentiated, they're not going to be truly objective about things and impartial and, you know, use logic in its pure form. There's going to be a bit of contamination from their feeling side, which already knows what it wants and why it wants it and why it's important to them. Um, so that that might interfere with the actual process of the of the thinking side. Um, so it's that sort of idea that, that, that they're not completely pure from each other and therefore maybe not functioning as well as they can do. <clears throat> Hang on. Can you stop rustling papers and stuff? Right. Um, the other one is um, internal differentiation. And this, this touches a little bit on what I'm going to talk about. And this is for every preference. There's a, there's a good side to it and there's a not so good side to it. Oh, so, for example, again, um, 
to take the thinking preference at its best. It's objective, it's um, clear thinking, it's logical, it's impartial, it's looking for the best result, even if it's not what suits you. Um, however, we all know it has a side that's critical, domineering, bossy, um, well, it's more extroverted thinking, but um, detached perhaps. Um, so there, there's a side to it that isn't so nice. And that's the same with every preference. There's good sides and there's bad sides. Um, so it's about um, separating out um, the, the good and the bad, but also owning. It's a bit like that owning your shadow stuff. So owning the fact that you have aspects of yourself that aren't so great, but they're actually within your preference. They're not, they're not non-preferred. Um, so that's Jung's bit. So that's where we all differentiate and start to split up and things like that. And, and, and that will go through different stages of development. And then the individuation is where we stick it all back together again. So it's where, again, where we're turning that volume down on our type and welcome the other stuff in um, and becoming a bit more rounded. And, uh, and human. So that, that's the very, very brief version. If you spoke to a Jungian, they'd probably say it in a very different way. Okay, so um, looking at the ego development theory, I've just put this graphic up. There's a lot on it, um, but basically it's just to, to, there's an illustration to show you that there's this idea of different named stages. So power and control at the bottom there is the uh, one of the earliest stages. There are earlier stages, but they weren't relevant to type theory. Um, and magicians at the top the top stage in as far as I go, but actually the theorists have, have further stages than that. Um, and the idea of this is it's, it's called vertical development in terms of there's, there's a, a path that it goes through, um, there's a progression, um, it's not static. Where you'll see at the bottom, there's a line saying horizontal development. And horizontal development is more about when you when you learn about something about yourself. So you might learn about your type. Yeah. Great piece of information. Have a great time at the session. Go away with a head full of ideas um, and explore your type for a while and have that knowledge. Um, but the vertical aspect is how is that type going to change and unfold over time? So, so when we first learn about, about type, we read the description. The descriptions are deliberately written, written to be you know, typical stage. Um, but actually, there are all sorts of nuances that come from the vertical aspect on that. So I'm going to I'm going to keep going backwards and forwards with these. So even though there's a load of words there, don't worry about them at the moment, because I'm going to cover them as we go. Right. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to I'm going to start broad and then I get more specific as I go. So what changes through these levels of the type? as you go through this, this vertical progression. Honestly, um, broadening of perspective. So um, when, you're, when you're in your early stages or when you're a young, very young person, you have very black and white sort of thinking. Um, you might remember this, that, that your, your ideas are, this is good, this is bad, this person's good, this person's bad. Um, so it's very, very sort of narrow perspective on life. Um, and also your world, your world is small, so you don't think about the bigger context of things. Whereas as, as you develop through these levels, you become more into actually there are nuances, there are shades of grey, there's a whole rainbow out there. Um, and you can take on multiple views, you can be less, sadly, you go through a phase of being really less clear in your own thinking because you can see so many different views, different viewpoints. Um, but you also take a broader perspective in terms of being able to deal with complexity, um, wider context, spans of time, um, you know, past, future, history, everything, um, global context. So it's, it really is starting from um, a very narrow field of thinking to expanding out. Um, Self-awareness increases as well. So um, for some people, you know, learning about their type is one of the first steps on that journey. And I, I remember, because um, uh, my, my development, let's just say, was a bit slow, I think. Without um, but your age, exactly, You're demonstrating it nicely. Um, so um, my development was a bit slow. So I actually remember, even though I was in my mid twenties, first learning about type and going, "What? Not everybody thinks the same as me. Not everybody thinks these are important." <laughs> um, you know, it's, it was a real like that was the eye opener. 
um, for me. So that's the start of self-awareness. And from there, obviously, you keep working with it and keep building it up um, and exploring and exploring other aspects. So that self-awareness um, is there. Um, and also emotional intelligence. So not just the awareness of self, the awareness of others, how to work with others, but being able to actually manage your reactions and emotions um, better as well. Um, very good. I'm struggling at the moment, I have to say, with my managing my emotions. <laughs> anyway, joys of motherhood. Um, so um, relationships become more collaborative. So in the early stages, we can be very like out for ourselves or competitive. Um, in the, and in those later stages, there's more about actually, you know, we don't want to be in competition. We can do a lot more together and we can work together um, and things like that. So you'll see that in, in um, later stage development usually um, and defensiveness defensiveness is a massive one so um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with ego defense mechanisms a la Freud um, but things like projection um, and um, denial and repression and things like that are all really really tough hard defenses um, that we might use a lot more in the in the earlier stages of, of life um, but we will use defense mechanisms throughout our lives, but maybe tend to use the, uh, the less um, damaging ones as we go through. But generally, there's less defensiveness, there's more openness to feedback, there's more openness to looking at our own faults um, and things like that as we, as we develop through the type, through the stages. And mindfulness, I know that word goes around a lot, but in this case, I'm meaning it in terms of being able to monitor, it, it goes hand in hand with emotional intelligence in a way, in the way I'm describing it now, but being able to monitor your actions, think about what you're saying, think about who's around you. Um, so just actually, I, I could have easily put presence in there as well. So it's that idea of being not presence 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 as in being here now, um, being in the moment, um, paying attention to what's actually going on. Whereas when we're in the early stages, we're very much running on autopilot. Um, you know, we, we just do what we do because that's what we do. We don't think about why we're doing it or is it the right thing to do or should I try something differently? Whereas as the later stages come, that happens. <clears throat> like I was asking why they made me climb Mount Everest. All right, can you really be quiet? This isn't funny. So, um, you also get the idea that there are different strands of development. So we don't sort of have one stage and jump right feet first, boots and everything into the next stage all at once. There might be some parts of, of um, that theory, because it's quite multifaceted, that we develop at different times and different stages and different speeds. And this can sometimes go hand in hand with our personality. So there might be some personality types that are more um, just wired up, I guess, to develop um, self-awareness or awareness of others um, easier and others who might develop that cognitive broad perspective easier. So it, um, it really does depend. Um, so, so these things might be at, at different levels at different times. <clears throat> okay. So, um, Hang on a minute, just need to do a cough. <clears throat> so to explain how this, how this, how we experience this as people, um, you can only see or understand um, what's in your field of, of capacity at any one time. So to use an analogy, if you, and you're sorry if you've heard this a hundred times from me, um, but um, if you're if you're born in the jungle <clears throat> and your world is the jungle, then you might know quite a lot about jungle stuff and jungle plants and jungle animals and the weather that goes on there and things like that. But in your mind, that's everything. That's your whole world is that. And that's how the whole world operates in this same way with leafy trees and rainforests and monkeys and things like that. Um, and you won't know anything different. Now, one day you might, um, I don't know, there might be a storm, it might be a bit floody, you might think I need to do something different here. So you might climb up one of your tall jungle trees and what do you spy in the distance? You spy these snow topped mountains and you're like, what is that? I thought everything looked like this in the world and now I see there's something else over there that I, I haven't, couldn't conceive of before. Um, so you, you take your, your jungle kit and you go off for a very long walk to the snowy mountain and you stand on top of it like that lady on the first slide on her ladder you stand on top of the mountain and you look backwards and you see the jungle 
that you used to live in and you think wow I thought that was everything in the world and now looking back on it I can see that my perspective was limited or my ideas were limited and I didn't know everything now there's this and there's this and they call that um there's a, another theorist who works with something very similar here called Keegan and he calls this subject object um idea and, and his his assessment tool is called the subject object interview and it's all about what when your subject meaning you're in it that's all you can see but when when you're an object you you look away you, you detach from it you can look back on it so you most of us can probably look back on our childhood and say oh do I remember when I was at that phase when I was eight years old and thought I knew everything um and that and um, there's nothing that I could be taught. We're having big trouble with him at school at the moment because he's telling the teachers he doesn't need to learn anything from them. Um, but we all remember being that, even if it's at teenagers, just thinking, oh, my parents know nothing. I know everything. And that there's nothing else for me to learn in life now. I am there. And you're basically sort of 17 and a bit of a fool. Um, but that's your world at the time. Um, anyway, you progress, you climb up the snowy top mountain, you look out, you see the desert, so you trek over to the desert and you see the mountain and the jungle now from that view, and basically you start to like get more and more perspective on things as you move further out. Um, and then we all end up in, in old age going, actually, we all know nothing and we never will know everything and there's too much to know and what is the truth anyway and what they're, you know, so you get into that sort of thing. Angelina, just before, yeah. while you take a breath, yeah. a uh, question from Evelyn Lemoyne goes back to your previous slide about set strands of development. Mm. And Evelyn's asked, um, are the strands of development tied to type? Because you sort of implied they might be. They could be. Um, let me see. Can I go back there? Da, 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 da. Previous and previous and previous. No, I don't what hang on it's doing by build um there there is an idea and actually um what's his name joe maddox who writes about um emotional intelligence and he he designed with his colleagues the um emotional intelligence profiler he's actually done because there's a lot of this that, that is about emotional intelligence he's done some work looking at what different types might develop at different stages you know quicker um with the, you know the general idea that you know if you're an extroverted feeling type you might be more interested in other people and what makes them tick so you might pay more attention to observing that and developing it and wanting your relationships to be smooth um, if you're a thinking type you might sort of enjoy complexity and things like that and be really drawn to that sort of thing um so i haven't I haven't got it totally mapped out but i know he's done some work albeit not exactly on this theory, but in a similar vein. So that's um, Joe Maddox, who uh, I can't remember what the company is called now. It was JCA, but now yeah, it's PSI, PSI, I think. PSI, PSI now. That's yeah. But um, yeah, emotional intelligence profiler is actually a really good emotional intelligence tool. So I hope that answers it, um, Evelyn. Um, so to have a really... Oh, quick whip whisk through the the stages here um the the earliest stage that i've pinpointed so that there are obviously earlier ones in in the theory but the one that i thought was relevant is the um it, it, i've called it power and control because the uh, i need to say this as well in case any of you use the other theories or, or um work with people who use the other the, the theories the theory by Lovinger and um, developed by Cook Groy to use different labels. But my problem was those labels could be seen as um, having connections with certain types. So I purposely changed the label. So it wasn't that I thought I was any better or anything. It was just because I planned to connect it to type, I, I needed to change the words. So I call it power and control. In their model, it's called the opportunist. Um, and this is this is a very early stage um, of, of development where um, you're very much out for yourself. You're very highly defensive. Um, you're at the center of the universe and you need to win. You'll have you very much operate on autopilot, not really think about what you're doing, tend to behave the same way in every situation. Um, and um, yeah, and this this. All, all the other stages are okay. This is the one though where if you are stuck in here, you will have not so great relationships and quite a lot of conflicts and things like age. that. Yeah, that is your age. Um, so um, 
what was I saying about this now? Um, Lots of conflicts, la, da, da, that's it. Um, so, so it's a very, it's not a great stage, but what we need to point out about these stages is um, not many of us as adults will, will be, be fixed in this particular stage. And, and um, also there, there is a bit of fluctuation with the stages, but you might be in this stage, you might meet people in this stage if they've had very, very damaged upbringings like that poor sunflower that we saw earlier. Um, if they if they've been from deprived families, if there's been abuse where they they've just had to learn to um, that, that that's the way it is. You be for yourself and you defended and things like that. So you, if anyone who works with um, possibly things like prison populations and things like that um, might see this in adults who are stuck there. But most adults will have shifted out of this. It's a very, very young child um, sort of stage to be in really. Um, that having been said though, um, as I said, these stages aren't fixed and we don't always operate out of that maximum that we've, we've reached. Um, and what can push us down is stress and things like that. So if we're, if, say you're trying to park your car and you've found the perfect space and you're just about to go into it backwards and someone whips into it forwards, you become a complete savage and you will find yourself behaving in this power and control way. Um, so any, any stresses can like throw us back into, into those behaviours and our brain shrinks, we see red, we're highly defensive, um, you know, and all that stuff. So it, it's not that you'll never see it in your life. If you've grown out of it, you will, um, but probably only under pressure. Oh, okay, um, the next stage I've called social identification. It's originally called the diplomat. Um, is it the yeah, the diplomat. Um, and this, this is an interesting stage and some adults um, stay here. Um, but it's where you feel the need to fit in. You have a, a group that you feel that you, you belong to, um, but it's very in group, out group. So you'll, you'll belong to one group, but you'll find that the others, you know, the other people aren't quite so, so right. Um, and in terms of, of working with type, you might find this in younger people, in teenagers, or actually, Molly, I'm talking about you more than I thought, in people who aren't sure who they're supposed to be. Or they might ha have an idea of I should be like this, I should be like that. So when you're working with them on a type level, you'll hear a lot of the shoulds, must, ought tos, um, which one's the right one to be, etc. From them, um, but but they tend to have very good relationships with those who they're they're close to and things like that. But they'll be can be judgmental about the the people they see as as out group. Um, and again, you'll see this in workplaces where cliques form. Um, where um, yeah, little little subgroups form who are anti other group or even departments. You know, like marketing hates sales and sales hate um, HR and everybody hates IT. Um, it's you know you'll see these little behaviours that go with this sort of this sort of mindset. Um, football supporters on a Saturday, you know, you get your little tribe together and off you go. So um, you, you do see it in adults, but in certain circumstances, and some people do stop there. So it's probably important to say at this stage that you, you develop to the stage that um, you need to be at in life. And development comes from pushing your comfort zone or stretching yourself or having circumstances in your life that um, require you to, to make a change or shake you up. So sometimes the worst things that happen in our lives, bad as they are at the time, can eventually lead to development, as I think some of you probably know. Right, this next one's called personal identity. Um, in the other theory, it's called the expert stage. Um, and this is where, th this is one of the most commonly found um, modal stages that a lot of people are in um, and this is where you sort of you know who you are you have a good sense of your identity you're differentiated you know you know this is me this is not me this is what I like this is what I'm good at um, you, you're not too fussed anymore about whether or not you fit in with other people um, because you're you're sort of um, you know what you want so you'll find this a lot in um, professional workers who have a clear sense of who they are and what they do and um, things like that um, but it doesn't make for very good um, empathy towards other people and things like that so if I scoot to the next stage the next stage this is also one of the modal ones so these two that I've just put up here are where most people pretty much 
um, finish their development unless they've, they've, they've pushed. Um, and determined action, this is where um, people, yeah, they know themselves, they're, they're quite well functioning, but actually they've got an appreciation of other people as well. So they'll say, do you know what, I'm not that great at this, but I know somebody who can help me, or they'll seek advice from friends. Um, but it's still very, it's got here need to find the answers. It's still got a very, um, there is a, an answer to something or, so, so, for example, when you're coaching these people, they'll be really keen. They'll love being coached and they'll they'll know what goals they want to work on and all that stuff. Um, but they'll say, right, what do I need to do to like, they'll say, what do I need to do to get to the next stage? <laughs> it's like it's not really that easy. <laughs> um, so but but in their minds, it will be, you know, you, you, you get a plan for things, you, you get action, you you do this and you you progress. Um, but they're they're actually really great to coach because they tend to be very keen and, and stuff like that. So um, that determined action or, or what was it called in the other theory? It's called the achiever is pretty much a good level to be at if you're in management um, of people, because you will you, you'll you'll appreciate the talents that others have. You'll know yourself. Um, and things like that whereas the stage before you might be a bit too much wrapped up in um, my way or no way type of um, thinking a little bit so so this next stage the determined action is really good to, for, for people who are in management um, if they're at that stage right the, oh, the next couple of stages there's quite a big jump um, in in the in the model um, so these are called the post-conventional stages, and this is where you find fewer and fewer people um, developed at this level. Um, but this this level here, uh, what was it called in the thingy? I think it's called the individualist. Um, maybe maybe uh, Linda can pop it in the chat, whatever it's called. I think it's the individualist. Individualist or pluralist. That's it. Thank you. I knew you would know. <laughs> um, but I've called it considerate individualism because individualist, again, sort of felt like a type that maybe was either, you know, detached or introverted or something. Um, but this is this is where you, you can start to see multiple perspectives on things um, and you're more inclusive. You seek other people's opinions. You know that, you know, a few minds are better than your own one. No, hang on. Can you can you stop doing that really? Um, you know that a few minds are better than one so you seek other people's opinions but it's actually can be quite an uncomfortable stage to be in because you see so many different perspectives that you you actually can find yourself conflicted of like well I don't know which what, what to do because I can see there's there's um merits in all these things um right this is where this is where my ability to even explain it bottoms out because in that jungle diagram I'm sort of like I don't know in the desert or something so my ability to even explain the next bit just comes from the books. Um, but my understanding is that um, at this stage, that inner conflict that you feel at the, at the considerate individualism phase um, resolves itself and you can actually synthesize the, the information much better together. Right. So, um, and then there's one more stage, which I am not even gonna have a crack at um, explaining, but it's called magician in the original theory. And I kept it called magician because as you saw from earlier, I like that sort of thing. Um, and um, it, it's where you really have the real breadth of perspective, um, things that integrated very, very systemic thinking, but I don't even touch that. So I can't explain what it's, what it's like to be one. Um, but very, very few people um, hit those those higher levels. And it's really important to note that the, the mission of all this isn't to climb the tree until you're at the top and like, yeah, we all got to be magicians. We failed in life. The idea is to to try and develop into a stage that suits your life circumstances. So if you are a manager, being at determined action will mean you'll probably be a pretty good manager. If you're a leader, um, broader leader, considerate individualism is a good place to be and and beyond. Um, but but not everybody is you know you don't you don't need that in your life if um, if, if that's not what your life requires. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> okay. Right. I'm going to take a little pause from talking, and some of you might have seen this before. Um, but it's a, it's an interview with with Keith, Keith Richards, and I've just read his biography actually, which is really enlightening. Um, he's believed to be an ISTP, and I think from the biography that that did come out, even though he just seemed to have quite a strong 
feeling side um, when when uh, he's offended by friends. But um, it's someone interviewing about the book he's written. And what you'll notice when you look at this interview is you'll see that that thing of looking back um, and not realizing at the time what was going on, but now you're looking back on it, it's there. Um, you'll see that shift of being able to think more expansively and more contexty and more over time. Um, but you also see what comes out is, is, is going from like that real ego, yeah, I'm this and I'm that, to really getting the qualities of your type going where um, your type's in good balance, but the, the really nice sides of being an ISTP are there. So that living in the moment and appreciating what's what's around you. So to do this, I just need to come up. While I find that, Catherine, is there anything, any questions I need to deal with? Um, Why am I somebody, like I am? Somebody wanted to know, I think Phoebe wanted to know, what was the name? Oh, sorry, Patrick wanted to know, Patricia, I'm sorry, I can't read. Patricia wanted to know what was power and control in the other theory. Oh, it was um, opportunist. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Opportunist. Yeah. Great. Right. Now I need to try and share my screen. Hold on a minute. I've got to try and find where it is. Uh, that's the slideshow. Where is the actual thing? Oh, that's a bit annoying. Hold on a minute. Um, sorry, looking about. That's sorry. That's a slideshow again. Uh, now I've fallen out of where I am and I can't find my way back. Hold on. Um, technology. Right. Hold on. So let me just see if I can share from there. No. Sorry, everybody. I'm a bit. Um, don't worry, we can, we can all take a little breather, Angelina, while you're... Yeah, I know, that, that might be good. Sorting um, yourself out. It's weird, I, I did it earlier. Hold you on. did? I did. Do you know what got, is it in your Google, is it in your, your browser somewhere? I'll do, it, I'll do it in a different way. I'll do it in the way I did it earlier. Stop trying to be clever with it. I thought I'd have it all lined up and ready, you know how it is. Um, right, get back into Zoom. Why can't I get back into the Zoom window now? I'm not, am I sharing? No. Uh, no, you're not sharing, I would say. Okay, hang on. I, for some reason, it won't let me get back into the Zoom window. Um, hold on. That's weird. I haven't accidentally disconnected. No, I'm not disconnected. No, you're, still, you're definitely still here. We've got a lovely view of you. Oh, hang on. Right. There, oh, there we go. Hold on. Oh, really, um, I do despair of myself sometimes um how did i do this earlier we tested it and everything people we really did we did yeah i mean you should just what we did before you stopped sharing your slides and then you just did a new share screen but obviously you yeah. chose the new screen yeah hold on let me see if that'll work now share screen see if i sorry see if this works yeah i think this that looks like it's going to my first experience okay. of the pink slip you know, when the voice broke, yeah, and I think it says in the book that there was two other guys. I mean, we were all good sopranos and we'd done yeah, some stuff around in London. We sang for the Queen, and, you know, which, hey, when you're sort of 12 or something, it's a very big deal, you know. And also you get a free bus ride to London. <laughs> yeah, boys. <laughs> but the way you put it in the book, when, when you, because you had this benevolent choir master and then your voice broke and they sling you up, that, seems to me to be actually a really important turning point in your life. That seems to be the point where you just decided that school and authority was not what you were going to follow. It probably was, and the more I thought about that, and that was, I mean, this is where the rebel got born. And I think it was just totally unfair treatment that we were concerned about. Oh my God, we sang our hearts out for this school, and then it's just like a, you know, the boot. And you say, oh, welcome to life. Is this just audio or is it video? At a certain point, whether it was a, a day or an evening, you, you have... Oh, can it not be heard? Yeah, we it's can audio. hear it. It's just audio, isn't it, Angelina? There's no picture. Oh, no, no, it should be video as well. Oh, we don't have the video. Oh, okay. We're seeing Thanks. your cell structure. Thanks, Linda, for po pointing that out. I had thought it was just audio. Yeah, oh, dear. Do you know Do what you I'm... just need to double-click on it, Angelina, to open it fully? No, see, I can see it on my screen. But, um, You're yeah. probably sharing the, 
Um, in the wrong bit, maybe. The, the wrong screen. Yeah, let me have a little look. Stop share. Let me just see if I share screen again. Is there anything? Ah, is it that? Can that be seen? Yes. Yeah, there we go. Oh, sorry, everyone. Oh, see, rehearsals. Don't do anything for me. All right, carry on. <laughs> Elvis Presley's song, Heartbreak Hotel. And it was as if the world before you heard that song and the world after you heard that song weren't the same place that somehow mm -hmm. a new thing had opened up for you. I think, I mean, I mean, in my mind, I think the world went from black and white to technicolor. There was a spark, yes. I mean, and suddenly I hear in this music out of nowhere that is. Uh... Suddenly, is everything coming to focus? all you wanted to do. Well, it was just a fascinating journey. Uh, you know, and it was presumptuous, you know, of like, you know, 18-year-old white kids from London say we're going to be the best blues band in London. You know, on, you know, in retrospect, the ludicrous sort of aim of all. But, but a very short retrospect, because almost as soon as you feel that you've got somewhere, you're on the TV and you're, you, 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 I know, you've got a hit record and, and, oh, what are we going to do now? I mean, you were, what, 20? When suddenly you're performing in front of know, you know, thousands of what you, you describe as feral the, female teenagers. Oh, Ravage. <laughs> in retrospect, history says that you were part of a, of a change in consciousness. You were part of a change in, for example, how men express their sense of who they, who they are, who they can be, the way Mick sang, the way you yeah. dress, no, it, did it feel like that at the time? Did you feel like you were changing things at the time? I don't think that you would find us sort of that uh, aware uh, of those perceptions at the time, but I didn't think it took us too long, slowly, sort of, for, that to, for us to realise that, uh, that yeah, you have something unique uh, and, it, and it's not me and it's not the band it's not it, it's just a unique uh, meeting of cultures and and time that uh, this this could happen yeah. I mean, the 60s were weird in that I, I basically think it's all to do with world war ii and that it was just that generation bursting uh from that uh oh, forget about the war please if you look at pictures of Keith at the beginning of 1967 and at the end of 67, it's almost like you're looking at two different people. The face changes, deepens. And you look at it and you realize stuff happened that year. One of the things that comes out very strongly from the way you write in the book is, is the is the joy of being in the moment of playing the song and, and of people listening to the song and, and, and of the other band members performing the song and the, the song coming together. And, and I think if I take one thing from the whole book, it's that the best thing in your whole life is that. I mean, I might be wrong, but- No, I think, yeah, you probably put the nail on the head there. It's watching something little, you know, idea, uh, and just the way it's picked up. I mean, it's something you had no hopes for, particularly. You you, know, you just have ideas, you know, say, hey, I've got this one, you know. And and just to see the interaction of other people. But it's also that very important thing of bringing the right guys together and recognizing their talent and what they have. And, and even them making you realize that you have some too. I think I threw out a piece of crap and that's great. And I said, it really is not so bad after all. But also, yes. it's my first experience of the pink slip. Right. So, let me stop sharing that and put the slides back on. So, um, I think you could, you could see there some of the things that um, I was talking about earlier. Um, in, in the way he's looking backwards retrospectively, you can see you can see his type, but you can see how, how it's really developed and that appreciation of being part of something with others and collaborating. And um, he does loads of collaborations now. And there's there's been a lot of 
Uh, and also those jump experiences he talks about, things that really shook him up. So being um, thrown out of the choir, um, they had to repeat the whole year of school as well because they'd taken so much time to be in the choir. So that was that was a real turning point. Um, and then seeing Elvis, the world suddenly opened up and, you know, um, things like that. And obviously there's been quite a lot of drug taking involved as well with him. But um, yeah, that, even that's been a, a sort of learning experience. And um, yeah, the, the book's quite... The man has lived. Um, how he's still alive is a different story. Anyway, so hopefully that was a little illustration of, of um, what I was talking about. So um, I've got a couple more slides and then I'm going to do a breakout room. Um, but to, to relate this back to the Jungian differentiation and individuation idea, um, these are two cards which you, if you've been to one of my presentations before, I always get these out. Um, this is how I think about type that that Part, part of type is you've got to know yourself and then you can actually find things that suit your, your niche and things like that and um, be genuine to yourself and be authentic. So it's that idea of like, we must all dance the music of our own drum, but what if our own drum's broken or we're hearing someone else's drum by mistake? Um, and, you know, that, that stage I told you about social identity where you're like, well, who should I be and which group do I belong to? Um, that, can, that can sort of relate to this sort of idea. But using the drum analogy and thinking of the stages, um, that power and control stage, if you're working with someone with type, um, as I said with myself as well, it's like, oh, your drum is different to mine. That might be as much as they need to know at that moment if they're very new to, to self-development or, um, or, or they've come into a session defensively, um, not wanting to know too much. That could be as far as, as somebody needs to, to know. Uh, again, it's already getting that idea that I'm different to you, even though instinctively we've always known these things, it, it, it highlights it. Um, and the social identification, well, which drum should I be banging? Who should I be? Which is the best drum to have? Um, so trying to move people out of that and to, to get into the next stage, which is actually, this is your drum. This is the one you work with best. And yes, actually, I like my own drum best as well. <laughs> it's better than your drum. So that's how I see the differentiation. Um, and then the determined action stage, you start to get into a rhythm with, with the other drummers as well. You know, you start to collaborate and work together. So maybe it's a bit of a silly analogy, but it works for me. Um, and then the other part of type is, OK, you know what your type is, but you don't want it to trap you. You don't want it to because there's times when it's not good to be you or actually you can really restrict your life experiences by saying, you know, this is me and this is not me or I do this, but I won't do that. Um, so th there's this idea of you have to break out of it as well. Um, so the butterfly of freedom, why do you fly outside the box? I fly outside the box because I can, but we know the box, we're safe inside the box. That my friend is why I leave it. You might be safe, but I'm free. Oh God, get rid of one and another one comes along. Hold on. So, <laughs> um, so this is where I sort of see the individuation starting as well as like, okay, I know who I am, but I also want a bit of the, the other stuff who, who, you know, what else is out there? I want to be more accepting of things that aren't me. Um, and then being sort of comfortable about that, that um, you're more comfortable to be outside the box. It's no longer a scary place or a mysterious place, but actually it's just more starting to be integrated into who you are. So you don't change your type or anything or become someone different, but you, you integrate authentically um, some other parts of yourself. Don't know what magicians get up to, so I put the box as an illusion. Is there a box? Are we even here? So um, what I wanted to do at this point, just to give you all a chance to sort of chat about what you've heard, is put you into some breakout rooms. Catherine, do we have a rough idea how many people are here? Yeah, we've got 37 people here, Angelina. OK, so if you want about four in a group, I guess that's about nine breakout groups. Yeah. Oh, thank you for doing the maths for me. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to find, oh, there's breakout rooms. So I'm going to randomly assign you to breakout rooms um, just for um, probably like literally two, two minutes each, um, just to share any thoughts you've had or have a chance to talk about it. Um, let me think, what would I get? I'll do, what's the actual time? Because that's never right. Um, I'll do it until, until 10 past. So that is yeah. eight minutes. Yeah. Okay. That works well. right. I'll send you off now.
So in case anyone's not sure what to do, you should get a message inviting you to join a room and you just have to click to accept uh, to join the, the room you've been allocated to. So everybody gone? Everybody should have gone. There was one lady, Gail Valentine, who doesn't have a mic or a camera. Oh, okay. So uh, looks like she might have gone, actually. She said she wasn't going to go, so I said, well, you don't have to. But um, yeah. it looks to me like she has actually gone to the okay. room, which is fine. Good, and, yeah, yeah no, we've three just got one in room. Three. But yeah, nine, nine groups, one room with, with just three people. So that's worked all right. <laughs> Good. Well, Angelina, you're doing ever so well to cope with children and cats. How do you do it? <laughs> that child is such a pest, honestly. Difficult. Well, they don't realise, you know, they don't realise. So you, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> there isn't an answer. <laughs> it's just quite funny, like, when you're talking about it, he's going, that's me, isn't it, Mum? That's my Yeah, yeah. Like, what's my well, type? Well, I think, I mean, I get so easily distracted. <laughs> I would have been completely thrown by that. So I think you've done really well. Yeah, no, oh, that's the point Sorry, I just need to stop recording. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're a bit tight for time and there's quite a lot of groups, so we can't really do the go around and see what was interesting. Um, but I hope it just gave you a, a little quick two minutes to get anything off your chest that's been um, been brewing while we've been talking. And um, if there is anything of particular interest, please pop it into the chat and, and Catherine can pick that up. Um, so I need to reshare my screen again. Are we here? No, hang on, that's not it. Ah, damn, hold on, wrong one. Um, it's that one, isn't it? Right, is that working? Yeah, okay. Um, so just a, a couple of bits to, to talk about. Right, do you know what? I'm, I'm actually not gonna do the research stuff, but suffice to say, um, for my PhD, they, they made me sort of hit this idea with hard numbers and, you know, all the other stuff that goes with it. Um, and I did some did some studies that gave evidence that um, the ego development is actually something that people can see and it helps people be more effective in their interactions. Whereas neuroticism, which the big five people are always going on about, why isn't it there? Um, neuroticism is... Um, didn't actually affect the the interpersonal side of things so if you're really interested in what all that was about you can look at the symposium uh, presentation from last year um, but it actually get that what I found in that research does go with what Myers said Myers said a person with low confidence aka neuroticism is more of a problem to themselves whereas high compensatory strain which is what she calls defensiveness and like generally is that development is more of a problem to others so um in a way it was quite good because it sort of supported what she was saying that people don't always they don't always know how neurotic you are and how much you're driving yourself mad um but they will notice if you're defensive and um you know lacking emotion intelligence and things like that um i'll just skip that there so just a couple of things about how how this can be applied um Sometimes I use it to think about how would you work with type at someone at the different stages? And we, we touched on it lightly with, you know, somebody's new to all this stuff and, and not particularly done much development work on themselves. It might be enough just to know that not everybody's the same as you and then to start looking at their own preference and then gradually start to look at the other preferences and start to get an understanding of other people. Whereas to try and throw all that on one session would be far too much. Um, and obviously, when they're at the, the later stages, they can start looking at the, um, you know, the, the, the not so great sides of their own type and start to own those, uh, own their projections, own their shadows, own their dark sides, whatever. So thinking about how you would work with type at someone in the different stages um, and how are they likely to approach type work? So um, obviously, I think people get more and more interested in this stuff, the more they develop themselves, the more they want to develop themselves. Whereas people at the earlier stages might be like, yeah, what are you gonna tell me about myself? I don't already know. Um, and uh, be a bit testing and defensive. And also what's their type likely to look like? So um, in, in the, the book I wrote years ago, which hasn't got always the correct language in it now, I, I would change a few things um, about how I've described stuff if I could, but um, what's in there is, 
what are the types likely to look like at the different levels and it's, it's, it's a theoretical thing I got it checked out by a few people of each type and they said yeah I can see that in myself um, so you can look different at the different stages. Angelina just interrupts just briefly yeah. Linda Behrens has made a comment that she's found that when people are transitioning between level between stages um, it's often harder for them to find their best fit type. Mm. Makes sense doesn't it? yeah yeah and that's a really nice point um that Linda makes that you, you don't just like glide into the next type it's usually a bit of toing and froing and usually usually as a result of being challenged in some way so it can be quite a confusing a confusing time as well but yes I think that's a really good point as well that that you might not know who you are anymore or, or things like that because so much is changing mm -hmm. um there's a lot of words on this um and I'll, I'll probably be able to give the the slides as a handout or, or some of the slides as a handout afterwards so you can look at this at leisure but it's just a little idea of like what people might be like as they at the different stages when they come for, for coaching and I guess it, it, it's it's theoretical it's typical um, it's not going to cover everybody but there's that people might gravitate towards um, being in these sorts of ways so um, it's a bit wordy for now so I'll, I'll let you look at that when you want. Now, the other thing is, if you're if you're designing, if you're in the market of designing uh, development centres or other inter interventions, um, there's this idea that some of the things that we typically pack into those development centres um, will work up to a certain level. And I think um, if, if you work in that field, you'll have all heard people come out of their, their latest leadership class saying, yeah, I didn't really learn anything new. It's stuff I've learned before or I've already covered or I, I feel comfortable with already. Um, I feel like I wanted to be pushed a bit more. So you can actually sort of bottom out, if you know what I mean, of, of, of um, some of the activities we tend to put in there. So where those white lines are going across. Um, whereas if people are really new to um, new to work, new to team build, new teams, new to um, supervisors, managers, all this stuff's just like, wow, I didn't know that before. And it's all really exciting to them. Um, so different things might be needed when people are at those more advanced stages. So just to give um, a little look at some of the options. So the sort of conventional things we tend to put in these development centres is we put in Myers-Briggs because it's really good um, and everybody's happy with that. Um, situational leadership stuff, team formation, how to communicate, how to give feedback, anything else you might think of. But generally, we have all those lovely four by four boxes that us psychologists love whipping out at the development center. Um, and as I said, to some people at early stages, that's all new stuff. That's valuable. That's life changing information. And they'll, they'll lap it up and they'll develop nicely from it. Um, however, when people are at those later post-conventional levels and they, they've sort of done all this, I, I get really annoyed when people say we've done Myers-Briggs because obviously we all know, because we're here today, that it's a constant, constant learning, a constant unfolding. So don't, don't park Myers-Briggs work in there <laughs> um, and think it doesn't belong in the post-conventional, but you'll be doing different things with it. And this is where I, I've named these things myself, ego bypass techniques, because I think if you do any more talking work um thinking about yourself work you're just getting the same old story we tell the same story about ourselves um whereas to really get deep some of the things that have had the biggest impact on me have been um real like witchcraft techniques of psychology where you um you um imagine where something feels in your in your body and what shape it might be and where it is and you tune into a feeling that might be alien to you and you really explore it and you realize when you've tuned into that feeling you've been telling yourself a huge lie for ages and there's actually something different going on to what your ego has told you you're about um and other things visualization free drawing um gestalt check techniques so like empty chairs and um things like that are all great um because they're, they're not talking therapies they're asking you to explore in, in a different way what's going on for you um, other things are stretch projects, anything that throws you out of your comfort zone that you would usually say, no, I don't do that. Or, or you know, if it scares you, do it. Um, they can really help people develop. And I haven't got it in here for some reason, but constellations, anyone who works with constellations, um, stunning, stunning stuff to get you to see things that wouldn't have otherwise come to the fore if you were just talking about it. 
Um, but what's really, really important is that people have reflective coaching. They have somebody to, to, to talk to, to reflect on, and maybe who can use some of these techniques as well. So it's, it's just a quickie there saying that, that this theory, it's, while it's interesting and thinking about how it works with type, we also need to think about where, where our clients are or where people are in, and where, where ourselves are in our own development and what we need to do to keep progressing. Right, last little bit before I go into Q&A is people often say, how do you measure ego development? Um, it's a tricky business. So the tr traditional um, assessments are things like the sentence completion test, leader development program, or the subject in object interview. But these are all very lengthy processes that require a human to sit there and evaluate responses there's no there's no multiple choice there's no click box it's all um projective techniques free thinking um so a sentence completion te test that should say um would be something like um i think the police are um you know and and you you free form whatever your your next part of that sentence is or motherhood is free form the next part of your sentence and then a human has to actually grade that as well and it's similar for for all these things so they're not treat they're not easy things to do and there's also that issue if you go back to the strands of development that, that they tend to put you at a level whereas actually you might develop some bits here and some bits there so um that they've been mainly used for research and things um but i find that sometimes you can get a little bit of a gist of where someone is so if you Take the assumption they're at those typical levels to start with. So they're somewhere in the middle, unless you're proved wrong. Um, questions like, what, what do you think is good leadership? That can be really telling. So if somebody's saying, well, good leadership is getting people to do what you want, it's an indication that they're, you know, they're, they're not done much development <laughs> on themselves. If they say good leadership is actually facilitating others to get the best out of them or something along those lines, you think, OK, you're, you're probably, um, you know, quite well developed person. So there's some questions you can think of to ask that will give you a, um, a, a bit of an inkling. Um, and attitudes to feedback, there tends to be a, a resistance to feedback in people at the earlier stages where people at the later stages are, you know, bring it on. I, I just really want to know, you know, what's my impact on you? How can I improve? So that can be quite telling. But again, none of these are set in stone. Oh, there we go. And that is all I had to say about it. That's the book I wrote that's got the what it's like at different types and things like that. And there's also a chapter on it in this um, Power of Personality book as well so that's that's all i was going to say about it i'm going to stop sharing so i can see you and just in the last few minutes sam ask if there are any any burning questions or if there's been anything popped in the chat catherine that i need to talk about oh catherine you're on mute the phrase sorry i did i did click but it didn't work uh, yes so there's lots in the chat lots of discussion going on about different types and development and so on but i think it'd be great if we had one or two questions from people for angelina i can see david hodgson has got his hand up so hello. Shall we have david? yeah hello angelina thank you that was brilliant uh well done for the distractions and managing those uh, I was just, I was wondering, um, can you think of any examples of people that are at the magician level? Are there people, examples of people, humans that have got there? Well, of course, if you ask me, I would say David Bowie was. Um, but actually, it might be something, um, um, Linda might actually have a better take on this if she's still on the call. It's, oh, Linda, there you are. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Because it doesn't come to mind easily for me, David. <laughs> Um, I think there are a lot more at that stage than there used to be, and and even later stages. Um, Terry O'Fallon has developed a, some later stage definitions. Uh, I'm trying to think of, of people. I I think possibly Barack Obama might have been at that stage, at, at the at, at least at that stage, because of his capacity to see so many perspectives. That's, that was what the development people at the time of the elections and stuff was talking about. And there may have been another president, but rarely have we had um, presidents in the United States that have the capacity to really take enough perspectives in. Yeah, I actually, I actually 
No, I actually used him. I didn't want to get um, political because I don't know much about it, but I, I actually used him as an example um, mm -hmm. when I did the APT um, presentation and had a film of him doing his his leaving speech, um, whatever mm. you call it. And instead of it was all, well, I've done this for you and I've done that for you and, and I've been so great, like some people would do, it was all, I want to thank you people because you have just guided me and, and given me this experience. And it, it was absolutely, yeah, really, really good example of very late stage development in that um, final speech. How about people like um, Nelson Mandela or Gandhi? Yeah. Maybe they might fall into that magician Level of development. Nelson Mandela, yeah, I would think, because I mean, his capacity to sort of like um, really get over what happened to him and and think forward and work with people who had, you know, per, you know, it was all there. I think so. Yeah, definitely. So thank you. The things like that don't come to mind for me very quickly, but yeah, I think they're the sorts of things. Magicians are hard to type. <laughs> I think they possibly they possibly are because they've got so many different perspectives. But then I always think if if um, if you take someone back to their their earlier years or something or or, or just upset them and wind them up, you'll see their type come out. <laughs> but um, mm. but um, yeah, if you take them back to earlier years, they can probably identify some preferences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And anyone else with another question for Angelina while we've got her captive here? Yeah, of course, Gandalf from Dumbledore, definitely, definitely. <laughs> literally. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Terry, I think in Australia, in Sydney, has got a question. Hi, everyone. Hi, Angelina. Yeah, thank you. That was a um, fantastic presentation. Great to think of how all these pieces come together. So one thing that really jumped out for me in your presentation was about collaboration and, how, and that ability, as you just said, with um, um, Barack Obama, about taking on other perspectives. So just interested in how you see just collaboration generally in that ladder of um, development. Yeah, because um, I, I, I think even in, in the earlier stages, people who do want to work with other people, there might always be a little element of competitive and keeping your bit to yourself, you know, no matter how, um, how teamworky they are. Whereas it is literally that genuine, there is no competition between us, we can all help each other um, get ahead and, and that wanting to work with, with other people. And I know if we go back to Obama, um, my, my memory which isn't great but I seem to remember people thinking it was a sign of weakness that he would say let's go and consult with the opposition and see what their perspective is on it and things like that and that he sometimes took a long time to to form what what he was going to do next because he could see the, the perspectives and everybody but um, that's sort of how I, how I see it if that answers what you're thinking. Mm, yeah that's great you know just made me think about I guess it's been um comfortable in yourself enables you to um, reach out and then I guess it's that magic magician idea of taking on all those different um, you know aspects of type perspectives that that are part of that development so yeah interesting I guess what it brings to mind Terry is, is this idea that that going through the development process um, you spend the first few years building an ego so differentiating finding out who you are and that's really important really really important to have a sense of who I am and what I do and whatever um but then the second part is all about then dismantling that ego so it no longer controls you or runs the show um mm. but it's it's always going to be there you're never going to be without an ego but you know when people say someone's got a big ego they literally do mean that it's all there on show but but there's something defensive about it you know that idea you're I mean ego defense you're defending your ego you're defending who you are whereas um you can't really really collaborate well with people unless you're willing to shed a bit of that ego mm. I think Chris That's Rigdon great. might have been trying to get in with a question just there actually Chris were you trying to get in with a question just, just an observation then I read Michelle Obama's memoir and her insights on Obama are really interesting because she's looking at him from the outside and before he got into power and all that sort of thing. So a lot truer ideas than maybe the political assessments. That would be an interesting read. <laughs> She's a yeah. brilliant writer. It's a great read. Mm. Cool. That's a becoming. Oh, thank you. So we are, we are on 8.30, Angelina. Mm -hmm. So we probably should wrap it up there. Yep. 
Okay, go. so, um, well, I'll say thank you on behalf of everybody to Angelina for such a fantastic, detailed, comprehensive presentation. And I particularly love all the analogies. Yeah, you're getting a bit of a clap there, a virtual clap yeah. from everybody, Angelina. Yeah, I know, it's got a lot I, of information, but... Um... Well, I think the sunflowers, the drums, the butterflies, the witches, I should be going to bed tonight <laughs> with so much going around in my head. <laughs> but, um, no, yeah and, and I was during the break I was sharing with Angelina some of my own experiences growing up and hopefully you had the chance to share some of yours when you're in the breakout groups so thanks very much everybody it's been great to have so many people attending thanks again to Angelina please join us you know over the next couple of months with our other events and yeah look forward to seeing you again sometime if you want to put any final comments in chat or whatever please do I'll stay on the call, Angelina will stay on the call till everybody's gone, but I think we do probably need to draw this to an end now. So thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of your evening or afternoon or, or morning or wherever you are. Bye everybody. Thank you, bye. I just want to say this was really great. Oh, thank you, Linda. I know we, 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 we use the same thing, but talk about it from a very different way of um, even the words and things. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I like the labels a whole lot better, the names, except mm. for magician. I don't agree with that one. But I, like, I don't like strategist either. Uh -huh. so, um, and there were some things that you said that I realized I really need to present to, the, to my students. So I'll be emailing you for some permission because um, I'm getting a lot of students who sign up for certification and they're interested 